my friend tells me they're getting an abortion, what should I say to them? What do you wish that your friends would have said? Usually when a young girl is pregnant and she is contemplating an abortion, the first thing I say is congratulations. And that's something that women usually don't hear. Um, they usually hear uh, words that are non-supporting. They need somebody to say, I'm here, I'm your friend, anybody. If it's a man, a woman. I usually say, congratulations, you are a mother. You're not going to bring a child into the world. The child is already in the world. And it is your obligation as a mother to, to defend life and to be create, courageous and to fight for your baby's life. And that's the, the words I usually use. Um, and also, just give her a lot of support. Girls and women, they just need to hear that somebody's there, that they're loved, and that their baby's loved. And that usually saves a life. We believe someone is possessed because we've seen them possess all the demonic signs you mentioned today. What should I do? A person who is suffering from a demonic condition, whether it be a full possession or a lesser uh, degradation of a full possession, God does not interfere in free will. So unless the person themselves understands the need for help and support and prayer and deliverance, the person who may be the friend is very limited in what they can do. The person can obviously pray that the person themselves who's been suffering this condition will themselves through prayer realize that their affliction is not something that they themselves can be liberated from on their own, but that they need to seek the help and the authority of the church. But I think that the person himself, if the person is the friend, I think the friend should do all they can to encourage the person to seek the help of the church and also accompany the person who is suffering this affliction to a local priest as a starting point. Andrea, what do you suggest for ways busy people can increase their prayer life and formation? Good question. Busy people, prayer, life, formation. Well, I think that that is sometimes saying we're busy is kind of an excuse um, to, to not pray. But I think it's really saying, well, what does prayer mean to me? And obviously there are going to be degrees. Now as a mom, I can't, I, I was used to doing my meditation, my prayer, um, you know, at the right, always at the same time. And with a baby, I kind of sometimes get it in at 9 p.m., which is normally what you do in the morning. So I would say is asking yourself, how much does it mean to me, and what can I do to put this into my schedule? So it probably, if you're a mom, you're not going to be able to schedule it in at 7 in the morning because the babies wake up. But can you um, have your husband take care of the kids for a certain moment and go into a silent room and do your prayer? Or if you're going to work, you have that time, and the easiest thing is to turn on the radio. How about you have some conversation with our Lord there on the way to work, or pray the rosary. It's not the best to pray, you know, while you're focusing on the road, but it's still prayer. So you talk to our Lord there. So it's being very, you know, creative and finding those moments. But if prayer means everything to you, it's going to be like eating a meal. We hardly forget to eat. If I need my prayer because it is, you know, like the soul needs the breath, you know, I suffocate if I don't pray. So I'm going to put it in at 8 o'clock at night if I need to, but it's going to be very important for me. And other ways are also finding moments to do a holy hour or adoration and maybe tacting with your husband. If you're a young adult, I really want to say this clearly. Recently, one of our... One of our um, masses, we heard that for young adults, you know, um, husbands live as you didn't have, if you didn't have a wife, and it, it mentions single people, you know, dedicate your time to the Lord. Right now, that you're single for young adults who are, don't consider it a time like, oh man, you know, I'm single, because a lot of times, Valentine's Day is coming up, and for a lot of you, it's like, well, I'm going to have a bro time, a, a galantine, and it's like, <laughs> and it's just like, it's a pity party. That's what it is. 
Don't pity yourselves. Right now is the best time that you have to invest in your relationship with Christ and in mastering yourself and becoming the best version of yourself. How many times we've talked to young people that are in relationships with their codependent relationships where basically I take from you and you take from me, but it's, I, I'm not whole myself. So I seek others to fill me, and that's when we start hurting each other. So build yourselves up, but use this time to pray, to become holy young men, holy young women. And uh, for other people who are busy, you know, married and all that, you know, be, be, be um, very creative in finding these times for prayer. But the, the question is, what does prayer mean to me? What is my spiritual life to me? And I then will find ways. Patricia, how can you make an argument against birth control to someone without a belief in God? I think science proves itself. Um, it's not a question of religion. It's proven that birth control, actually, a woman can abort um, while she's taking birth control during her menstrual cycle. It's been proven scientifically, and I think you can't argue with science. And it also, you know, there's... There's side effects to birth control. It's not healthy for a woman. It doesn't. It doesn't heal anything. It actually hurts the woman. And I think it's a form of selfishness. It's not a form of true love because, you know, giving yourself in totality is giving your fertility is giving your whole self. So basically, it's, it's it's saying I give myself totally to you, but I won't give you my fertility. You're not open to life. So I think it hurts men. I hurt. It hurts women. And I don't think there's any medical benefit to it. And Science proves itself, so we can't argue with science. Father Gary, how can you differentiate mental illness from demonic possession? I think that's an argument that is often posed by people who do not believe in the existence of Satan or the demonic realm. And so, Every team, every diocese in the United States has been mandated by our Holy Father. Actually, every diocese in the world has been mandated by our late Holy Father, St. John Paul the Great, to establish a ministry of exorcism, to select a priest and train them to be an exorcist. On our team, for example, and this is just in San Jose, but on our team we have a medical doctor, we have several clinical psychologists and several psychiatrists, including psychiatrists and psychologists who are bilingual. And as part of the discernment, we would have them evaluated by either one or more of our therapists to determine whether or not what they were suffering from was in the realm of mental illness, a satanic condition, or a combination thereof. Now, sometimes, it's very obvious. The authority of holy orders sometimes is sufficient enough that it can threaten a demon, maybe the hiding, but wanting us, me, the exorcist, to somehow be a believer that there isn't anything demonic present. And so sometimes that occurs immediately, sometimes uh, it doesn't occur at all, which sometimes, therefore, it may be simply a mental condition. But the reason that we have social scientists working with us is to discern out what is in the realm of natural from that which is in the realm of what we call the praetor natural, which is the realm between the natural and the supernatural. So I guess I get asked this question quite often as it applies to, well, how do you tell the difference? Having a team of our professional experts in specific areas of psychology, psychiatry, is also recommended in the forward to the solemn rite of exorcism. So the church takes a very conservative and a very slow posture and process with trying to ferret, ferret out whether or not someone actually has a condition that is treatable through social science versus through the ministry of exorcism.
Today we focused on external forces of evil. How do we battle with ourselves and the hell we create in our own lives through sin? Sure, yeah, that was my woo the English major. How do we battle with ourselves and the hell that we create in our own lives through sin? Wow. Yeah. Good and this is my question. Yeah. <laughs> Can I pass it on? <laughs> um, you know, outside, outside of the sacramental life of the church, first and foremost, of course, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the Holy Eucharist, um, the sacrament of reconciliation, which is in itself a sacrament of healing, okay? Uh, and uh, the beautiful gift of adoration, okay? First and foremost. Domestically, you know, when we're not in church, when we're not at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, when we're not disposed to the sacrament of reconciliation, when we're not in adoration, domestically, a lot happens there for me. When I wake up in the morning, literally, I'm not saying this just because I'm a speaker at a Catholic conference, the holy water is on my nightstand, okay? Before my feet hit the floor, my hand reaches for that beautiful sacramental, the holy water, and I bless myself in bed, okay? I get up, do what I have to do, I come back to the side of my bed, and this is just preparing for my day, okay? I get down on my knees and I make my morning offering, all right? After that, I get up, I make my coffee, I get back in my chase lounge because I am tired. <laughs> <laughs> I read Bishop Barron's reflection of the gospel with the gospel every day. After that, here it is. The question was, how do I battle the evil within myself and the evils that we face every day? I'm holding it up right here, okay? This is my war rosary, okay? And it's not your grandmother's rosary, okay? It's everybody's rosary. St. Pio said that this is the greatest weapon we have for ourselves in our time, okay? John Paul the Great said that it, it beats the rhythm of human life, drawing us into the rhythm of his life. And the, the fathers of the church tell us that there is no greater means of calling down God's grace on the family than the daily recitation of the rosary. Of course, so when I'm praying this rosary, I'm joined by the mother of God and our mother, you know, whose purpose did not cease when she was assumed into heaven, okay? She was created to bring Jesus to the world. And she was created and she lived to draw others to her son. That's what she does. And that's what I do personally as well in my consecration to Jesus through her immaculate heart to fend off the evil in my life every day. John, what would you advise to those struggling with the vice who keep failing to stay faithful and to trust in God's love and his mercy? You have to have an accountability partner. So I do believe that one of the things I would add is uh, you can't grow in faith on an island because you typically just think you're all good. So you need to have an accountability. Community is important. When we come together in mass, that's not about our own experience. It's about a community of the faithful, the mystical body of Christ giving due worship to God. So the same way we worship to God and give Him the praise that's due is the same way we need to approach our faith life in community. So. Look around yourself, not necessarily in this room, this is a good room to be in, not in a room, we're in the, in the sanctuary, but look around in your own life, who are you surrounded by? Because I would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. If you're struggling with the vice, you want to find people that are holier than you are, maybe further along and seek counsel and guidance. If you're a woman, find a women's group. If you're a man, find a men's group. See any one of us, I've got, I know of a couple of men's group myself, uh, that I could point you to. 
But surround yourself with people that are also seeking to become holy in their faith walk. Because then you're held accountable. Specifically, if you're dealing with vice, I would say go to the sacrament of reconciliation as often as you need it. If you think that, it's, you know, I myself try to practice on a monthly basis, no more than six weeks. If I need to go and I'm struggling, my wife and I will say, if we're struggling, we need to get to confession, even if we just went last week, or even if we just went three days ago. I just wanted to add that we go to the sacraments, but we find ourselves confessing the same sin, right? So I, um, I always you know, snap at people. Well, during that reflection and that, you know, analyzing your conscience so that you can prepare for confession, see what it is that you're confessing. And there is going to be a root vice, one of these. It's vanity, pride, or sensuality. And it's manifestation. So I'm always snapping at people. Am I snapping because uh, they're contradicting me? If they're contradicting me, it's probably because deep down it's my self-love that is being wounded. So what do I have to do? Well, I have to listen to others. So I have to find the manifestations from that root sin, in this case it's pride, and then say, well, how am I going to combat this? And be very practical, okay? Next time someone comes to me, I'm going to listen before I speak. Because my pride is going to say, I know it all, and I'm going to try to speak before you speak. I'm going to listen, and then I'm going to take a deep breath, something as practical. Or, you know, I'm going to put my hand in my pocket while I'm listening to someone so that I could, you know, hold on to something so that, you know, I don't snap. <laughs> because it's very practical, but we, we, we have to find, you know, these solutions to our vices because if we just keep going to confession, okay, I'm getting drunk, I'm getting drunk, I'm getting drunk. Well, why are you getting drunk? I'm getting drunk because I'm sad. Why are you sad? Well, because I don't feel good. Why don't you feel good? Well, because people don't like me. Well, okay, then that is a sensitivity. And if it's a sensitivity issue, maybe it's your sensuality. You want to be loved, but you're not seeking love in God, but you're seeking love in people. So do you see, it's, it's like if you're going to plan an event, you have the big picture and then you have the little steps on how to get there. We have to root out the main vice with the little manifestations, and then we, you, we're hitting it from all angles. But we can't attempt to, you know, be holy tomorrow, so I'm going to pray, you know, all of the, the chaplets out there and all of the novenas. No, I have to start with what I am. What is my condition? What are my manifestations of this sin? So, we talked about conditional love. How do I remind myself that God does not conditionally love me? I, I think it's a real kind of quick answer, and it builds on something Andrea was talking about, Grace builds on nature. If you have people in your life who are putting, who are really loving you with a conditional love, that's very obvious. Like I said, everybody's going to, we're all going to love it perfectly. The reason why I say that is because we are always going to impose our human experience on God. And so it's really hard to understand God's unconditional love for us when we've intentionally uh, surrounded ourselves by people who love us conditionally. So work to root those things out. And then at Mass, uh, attend Mass even with greater frequency, I would say, if you can get to a daily Mass. And again, every time the Eucharist is held up, uh, when the priest says, Behold, Lamb of God, behold, Him who takes away the sins of the world, after that, in your mind, just hear the Lord say, I love you. Uh, do you love me? And allow that to be your prayer and meditation at that point in Mass. There's simple practices that can retrain our brain to understand that the love of God is different. You will never fully get that. Because you're human, and you live in a world of beginnings and endings of life and death and of conditions. Your brain cannot fathom the mystery of God's unconditional love. But we can approach it, and then when you get to heaven, you'll be like, I get it now. It's regarding com committed couples planning to be married within the church. Where can they learn to show love while remaining chaste? So I'll start, and I'm sure we have a thousand answers to this one, but um, there is a ministry called Engage Encounter. My husband and I are speakers with that ministry. It's a weekend retreat, 
It is offered in the Diocese of Stockton multiple times throughout the year, and it, just, it covers all areas of love, of marriage, of finances, so it's a great opportunity to come together. They do it right here in Houston, so it's nice and local. Check out EngagedEncounter.com, and I might be wrong on the website. Um, other ways, there's always the parish. Uh, check with your parish priests for their marriage prep programs. Augustine Institute offers a program under formed called Beloved. It's a great 12-part video series. You can check that out. Some parishes have the subscription. You can get it personally as well. Anyone else want to chime in on marriage? Theology of the Body by John Paul II. Theology, uh, yes, thank you, obviously. Theology of the Body by John Paul II. Get the book, Amazon it. Okay. What we need to do is not just be chased prior to marriage, but understand the chastity required of married couples because I think this is where we struggle in as a country. Um, it's not that you get married and then all of a sudden your spouse becomes an object of whatever you want. It's that you actually are held to a higher degree of ensuring that her dignity or his dignity is upheld to what she or he is truly as a child of God. And so we have to gain back what God designed from the very beginning, that the marital act is to unify the spouses as one, that Trinitarian act of love as God being a communion of persons and to be open and to, God willing, create life. So when we separate those, obviously you see what we have in our culture. But I think simply said, especially in the theology of the body, as married people, that that's what we're called to do, that the ultimate end of that act is love. This love, not the other type of love. Okay?